I would like to welcome you to the second of our conversation on Pompeii psychological support. With us again today is Dr. Sue Hawkins, who's a practicing psychologist in Sydney, who specializes in genetic issues. Also with us is Maddie and her sister Jenna from the Associations Committee. Jenna lost her son Nate to Pompeii in 2016. Dr. Hawkins, genetic conditions like Pompeii, uh, the parents and even grandparents often feel a sense of guilt at their child's diagnosis, maybe as if it was their fault, which may even be worse after a passing of a child. What would be your advice? Thank you, Raymond. That's an important question. And guilt is a very common thing that happens with genetic conditions. I suppose when I'm thinking about what happens with that guilt after a child passes away. Um, I, I think about the impact of that guilt on everybody, the collective family guilt everybody carries and how that impacts on relationships and how people behave. Does it actually make somebody stay away? Does it stop parents from visiting more because they feel too mm -hmm. guilty? Does it um, impact on people actually being able to really support another person? Does it impact on you going forward into the next part of your life and enjoying some of it? Because people often feel like if I can't enjoy, I can't enjoy anything because if I, if I enjoy something, it means I don't hurt as much. So guilt can have very systemic um, impacts on people after uh, a child dies as well. And, and then they're not necessarily positive. And they sort of really take away from quality of life. And that tension between guilt and love is very confusing. But guilt doesn't mean love. They're, they're actually not connected. <laughs> guilt means your belief system doesn't match your behavior. Guilt does not mean love. And, and talking to people about that can be actually quite helpful. And if guilt is so paralyzing and impacting too, on too much, I, su I suggest getting some help around it would be useful. A grief and loss counselor would be really a good person to see. Um, and having somebody in the family that can just say, hey, you know, I think your guilt is actually a real negative for everybody, including yourself. And it may be useful to get some help around it because guilt isn't love. Could be one way to move forward. My question for you, Dr. Hawkins, is that it seems statistically uh, that marriage and relationships breaking down and like divorce is quite common after the loss of a child. You often hear that, you know, parents separate or whatnot because they can't handle it. Um, I know that in our instance, losing Nate, that that put a lot of pressure on Jenna and Sean's marriage, but also within our family. And it changed mm -hmm. The, our relationships as a wider family and the dynamic of the family as well. What's your advice for going through changing, um, you know, these changes and also maintaining healthy relationships while you're going through a grieving process? I, I would be thinking, when I'm thinking about what the sort of um, your story, I, I'm also thinking about the work has to be done before, not, not during the grieving process. Um, it makes it harder if it's not done before the grieving process to understand how it impacts because people grieve in different ways. So, some people just don't want to talk about it. They just want to get on, put themselves into their work, um, not face it. Other people just want to talk about it all the time. And if you've got a couple that are grieving differently, the, the stress on the relationship becomes really big. Um, and similarly in, in families about who should be doing what, there's an expectation of what grief should look like and how you should be and how you should behave. And if you go out and have a great time, you should not do that. Um, so, again, that sort of communication about um, how we grieve is so personal and, and the judgment needs to be sort of like, I don't think you can judge somebody for how they will grieve. Um, and there's sometimes where when people grieve, they actually start running away from the family to other people to, to stay away because they can't cope with the pain in the family. 
And in all those cases, I think, you know, having some, again, going back to some either counselling support, therapy to, to help those people that are struggling the most is probably a good thing. But you've got time to prepare for this, um, this sad um, death in a way. And, and if you know that's coming up, the, as much work as you can do around it about how to prepare is, I think, really important. Yeah, I think those are some great points there. I know that I can relate to a lot of those things. I know our family, that we're, we're a mixed bunch and we all definitely <laughs> um, yeah. deal with things very differently. Um, but, yeah, it's just great to know that you sort of need to prepare but also have to understand that everyone is going to take it a little bit differently and, and showcase their, their feelings differently. So thank you. And the problem is when the people that if something's different and then the people start saying, well, you shouldn't, and that just creates bigger wedges. When, when really it's the opposite of what you want to do, you want to get closer to each other. So what advice would you give to parents of terminally ill children or such as in my case, um, parents that have had children that have passed to their siblings? How would you advise that the siblings cope with like the upcoming death of the child? Or as I said, in my case, um, explaining to my daughter about her brother that's passed? Again, it's, it's a progression thing, I think, as you said, preparing them for it and allowing them to say what they may need as well to do or what they may, what they might want to do on, at different stages, like, you know, what, for example, the sicker the child gets in hospital, they end up in hospital and palliative care, you know, what, what, would this, what role does this sibling want to have? Does it want to come visit? Does it want to just bring presents over, you know, give a card? Um, talk to, I think children need to know about the, the child going to die. I think that's really important because otherwise it's, it's more scary. In a way, what's not, what's not concrete can be quite scary. They, their imaginations get worse than what's really going on, even though the death is horrible in itself. Um, and then allowing that child to participate in its own grieving process, what it wants to have, um, what it wants to do at the funeral, what it wants to do afterwards to commemorate, how it wants um, the house to be set up in some ways in its room. It might want some memory of its sibling. Um, it may want to have a photograph in a certain place. Um, and this is where your grief can get a bit complicated too because your grief can interfere with your child's grief um, and, and being a bit, your child might also pick that up if the child's worried about getting upset not to upset you. So telling your child, mummy's going to be okay. Mummy's sad. Mummy's going to be okay. Mummy's not. Mummy's going to be able to manage this. Mummy is never going to leave you. Mummy's always going to be there for you too. And if you're sad, I can hold your sadness too. I think that's a really important thing because a lot of children get protective and they see you being upset and they, they just try and make you feel good or whatever, but they're not allowing themselves to be upset. So they're holding back too. So just um, sort of reassuring them that you can hold this, you can manage this. And even if you cry, it doesn't mean you're not managing it. It just means you're showing it a bit. And showing a bit does not mean not managing. It just means that is the expression of grief. And grief is expressed in these ways. It's expressed by crying. It's, it's expressed by sitting down and just being quiet for a while. It's expressed by looking at photographs. It's expressed by going and buying flowers. They're just expressions of grief. But it does not mean not managing because kids get scared when you can't manage. That's when they feel out of control. I think that's quite helpful too. Um, but touching on the subject of kids with siblings that have passed, do you have any recommendations for that mm -hmm. on how, like what ages are appropriate to sort of give them a full explanation or, you know, is it always just something that should be mentioned casually so that it's never a big deal? Or I think initially kids kids give us a lot of feedback on what they can manage. So, um, and I suppose it's got to be age appropriate. So quite concrete when they're younger and as they get older, you can talk about sort of more expanded a bit more. But if a child doesn't want to know more, they usually change the subject 
and and listen to that child and how it's responding to what you're telling it. So you can, you can start by, you know, having books around that talk about, you know, little stories about, you know, siblings that have lost other siblings and then bringing it up occasionally and just seeing where the, where the, um, your other child takes it. Do they take it further and want to know something? Do they just shut it down and change the subject? Just allow yourself to be led a little bit by that. But always when they bring it up, always be open to stop and allow it to happen because when you shut it down, then they'll learn to shut it down. Yeah. Fantastic. That will be great to um, hopefully broach that. And, and, and so is it important to reassure children that things will get better in time or there's an end to these things? Or It's a funny thing to say because everything, life's such a um, roller coaster sometimes and, and we learn to adjust. And I think more of, a, more of a sort of an education that life sometimes is wonderful and sometimes it's sad and everybody goes, everybody goes up and down these things and there'll be other times in life which will be wonderful too coming up for you and you might find other times that are sad too but normalize it in terms of people go through hard stuff and then life does get better but you can't guarantee life gets better that's the only problem you can't always guarantee everything's going to be perfect so allowing for the lumps and bumps of life and and normalize it that way I think perhaps is a sort of a I don't know, a more balanced way of talking about it. But there will be good times to say there will be good times. Sure, because there probably will be good times. And I think that's that's important too. My question is probably um, backtracking a little bit from that previous discussion, but learning that your child has a genetic condition and in our case and in Nate's case that meant a terminal diagnosis, Um, that's a pretty hard thing to hear and it's a pretty hard thing to go through not only for the parents but for the whole family that have to sort of know that that is that it's inevitable Um, I know that our family we tried to try to stay positive when we took on the mantra of you know every day with Nate is a blessing um, and took that positive sort of approach but what would your advice be to families that are just sort of getting that news and that advice that it is a terminal diagnosis well, usually at that point, most people are in shock anyway. So it's, uh, that's people are in shock when they hear that. Um, my biggest advice is it's a marathon and self-care is really important. Taking time out is really important. You can't do this 24-7. Sometimes you need to take a weekend away. You need to look after yourself. Um, people go into the... Um, I need to make sure I get everything right 100%, fix everything perfectly, get every appointment done into that space. That's usually in the shock space. That's the initial space. Making sure, you know, I look at everything. They're on internet 24-7 and that's part of the process. But if it keeps on going, it's a burnout. It's a a situation for burnout. Um, So they need to be able to learn how to stop. They need to know if they don't cross every single T that is not going to make or break this outcome. So, you know, a good enough job, a solid job, but the obsessive job is going to be, it's going to kill a relationship because one person's doing that and the other person's just going, well, I'm just going to get on with it. <laughs> and there's there's a family dynamics having an issue. Um, the person that's doing everything in terms of, you um, going to every doctor's appointment, get everything on board, can get very frustrated they haven't got the support because they think people should be coming to everything and they're not. Um, lowering expectations of others sometimes if you're in that really strong caring role um, and also lowering expectations of yourself to get everything perfect is really critical. Being gentle on yourself, gentle on others, gentle on your relationship, time out. Self-care of its terms of getting a psychologist, getting a massage once a week, you know, doing anything you need to do so you're nurturing yourself because your whole focus is on another, and rightly so, a person who needs you really badly and all those other feelings that come up and the, and the physical tasks associated with helping that person as well as emotional tasks. So much energy is going there. You have to replenish yourself. It's critical. 
So, so um, in regards to the passing of children, that's a fairly heavy loss and it's not one that goes away and it's just sort of something that you have to learn to live with. Do you have any advice for people on coping mechanisms and how to stop the ripple effect of more serious mental illness, such as depression, PTSD, um, that, th that sort of thing? Yeah. Um, that's massive loss, total. It's not, it's not, nobody wants that loss. That's one of the biggest ones people experience. Um, and grief is a funny thing. It's sort of like I remember reading this sort of, um, it's like a poem on grief. It sort of made sense. They sort of talked about grief like as, you know, you're in a storm and the boat goes over and grief is the waves that hit you ten meter high waves that hit you every minute of the the next hour two hours three hours you're waxed by this these waves then gradually you might only get a wave every maybe every three minutes a big wave and then gradually a wave every hour and then the waves are getting a bit smaller and then life goes on but then occasionally a big wave comes and whacks you again so that is sort of grief after something that big how do you find meaning because it's sometimes it's about meaning after this what do you do and often people um after they lose something that that big they they find meaning in it the meaning has to be bigger than themselves sometimes when you have such a big loss the only way to 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 manage it i'm not even going to say move on is to find something bigger than yourself some existential meaning either in like doing this and helping others with this disease, um, writing a book about it, doing something that you find bigger than yourself and find ways of honouring the memory, find ways of, um, you know, when you have an anniversary date, doing something special. Um, I suggest people get people to um, light a candle and put a picture of the candle on their Facebook for all their, you know, from their, all their friendship groups on Facebook around the anniversary date to find connection in the loss, um, to find something. It doesn't ever 100% go away, but it becomes tolerable. And there are times where it hurts more than others. Um, the PTSD part, again, really needs some help. If you're finding yourself going through flashbacks of everything and it feels overwhelming at times, I think it's really important to get some support. Um, looking after your basic health, like eating well, sleeping well, exercising, is also really important to manage mental health. There will be times where you actually be surprised and find yourself having a good time and allow that. It's important to allow yourself because the guilt could come in and push that down. And again, guilt is not love. So it's really important to allow yourself those good times and try and hold the, put the guilt accountable for where, it, you know, this is about your thing about you, not about your son. That's really helpful. So I found the um, wave analogy very, mm. like, very relevant too. Mm. So I was going to say, Jenna, um, that's really relatable. I think that in Jenna's case and in our family's case, we call it seasons. Yeah. Uh, yes. Nate has his own season um, because there's a lot of significant dates that are all sort of close to each other. So you sort of know that you're coming into Nate's season and it and it and that wave hits as such and it's a little bit harder than it is every other day. Um, but then it, you know, after those significant dates and whatnot, it's not necessarily easier, but, um, yeah, it's not as hard. It's just less prevalent maybe. Yeah. It's less in your face almost. <laughs> yeah. That's sort of a nice way to, to look at Nate's seasons in a way too because it's part, it's part of his life journey and it's a sad part of his life journey. Um, but knowing a season also changes and um, it will never change, but the season around Nate might change and it, it might be less, you know, as long as you have a, good winter season not a bad one <laughs> so maybe that could happen as well and, and so is uh, Merit in going to see a, a psychologist uh, uh, again to try and help talk through some of these issues um yeah look I think again it depends on your coping strategies and what works for you sometimes families are really good with that because if the more people help help 
with the grief, hold the same space in the grief, the less alone you feel with it, because grief and loneliness adds, makes grief worse. Um, but seeing a psychologist that understands grief and loss, again, can be helpful too. Um, like I would normally see people around those anniversary dates, just before, during and after to work out ways of managing anniversary date, what they might want to do about it, how they feel about it, how everybody else around them is feeling about that. So that is, it's an important time, any of those anniversary dates, because um, they're very solid reminders. They're sort of lines in the sand, if you like. So um, it's but good to get, sometimes good to get support with it. So you'd recommend going to see a, a psychologist before the anniversary date to, as you say, prepare yourself a little bit? Or The way I've done it with my clients that I see is usually, usually just before the anniversary date and then after the one, one session after the anniversary date as well, just to sort of debrief and download what happened. And usually people find it wasn't as bad as they thought and they find that was a nice thing to do and they felt supported. So it's, it's not a bad, I found it useful thing. I think when you have a, a child or even somebody in the family with a major life-threatening problem, you sort of tend to know who your friends, some friends step up and some friends step down. And um, the friends that step up, um, they can step up in different ways. They may be the ones that bring you a meal or ring you up, say, how are you going, or go for a walk with you. Um, and how do you manage what happens afterwards too? Because some, some people think that once, you know, once the child has passed away and they've, they've done all the support, that life goes back to normal for you. But it actually doesn't, and it's that constant reminder that comes up. And sometimes your friends will sort of miss the boat on that a little bit, mainly because they it's not front of their mind as much as well. They don't really understand it. So sometimes, again, it's good to educate them perhaps or tell them this anniversary is doing this and this for me. And it, and it also means being vulnerable, which isn't easy sometimes for some people. Um, but those friends that have stood up would understand, I suspect, the ones that have gone, yes, I'm going to be here for this person while they're going through something. And, you know, as I said last time around, you know, those Facebook posts that I suggest people tell their friends to do, if, you know, I'm thinking about my child during this time and if you, if you want to join me, light a candle. And you'll find that people will do this and you'll be surprised at it. And that definitely makes, often makes people feel very less alone in their grief. Maddie, Jenna, Sue, thank you so much for your time today. We've covered some wonderful issues. Um, for more information, please visit our website. Uh, details are on the screen. Also on the screen are contact numbers for Beyond Blue or Lifeline. Thank you once again. Bye.